So, uh, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, I'm Jamie Kim. I'm working at System RSI Samsung Electronics. And I'm very excited to come, come back here for, to make my second presentation at the RISC-V Summit. Last year, I came here and discussed about the validating the performance for the RISC-V GPUs in the application processor domain. And today, I'm going to talk a little bit about the uh, adaptive interrupt architecture for the very extremely timing critical domains. So uh, let me begin with a little bit of introduction of the uh, system LSI products and how the RISC-V matters in our technology. Uh, as you can see in the picture, system LSI actually delivers a variety of different types of uh, ICs, uh, starting from uh, complex SOCs for the mobile, automotive, and DTVs, as well as a lot of analog and large-scale integrations uh, including the radio frequencies, CMOS image sensors, uh, display driver, the security and power ICs. And while these all types of different uh, applications have their own, own requirements and specification, they all share one thing in common. They all have CPUs inside, meaning that RISC-V has a lot of opportunities to you know, be Im embedded in the products if they have not yet done. And as I mentioned earlier, last time I came here with a little bit of more concentration on the general purpose cores, the application processor domain. And yes, we did uh, tape out the RISC-V based SOCs, and they were booting up the popular operating systems, including Android Wear and Tizen OSs. And I believe some of you may already have read or seen that uh, our v VD department announced and demonstrated uh, their digital TVs booting up with uh, RISC-V-based SOCs earlier this month. And I'm happy to share this news again. And with the competitiveness already seen in this product, I do believe and expect a, a productization of the digital TVs in the next following years. I don't know the exact timing, but I do expect. Uh, well, but, and, but in the dark side, Frankly speaking, I, we still see a very limited number of adoption of RISC-V in the general purpose of processor field. In the past, it was said that it is because of the lack of software ecosystem, uh, something like readiness of Android or something like that. But these days, a lot of different SOCs based on RISC-V is already powering up Android, and we are still seeing a uh, small amount of product. I think pers my personal opinion is that it's because of the lack of the performance. Uh, there was this conventional belief that the single core performance is already looplined uh, by the power and thermal walls, but in fact, we are still seeing uplift of the per uh, peak performance year by year. And it makes risk five uh, kind of difficulties to catch up with the conventional CPUs. And even if you do, uh, eventually, RISC-V will catch up in the performance, single core performance, but it is difficult to share the core values or differentiations between the again, uh, conventional cores. But on the other hand, when we go to the domain-specific architecture, RISC-V is really showing great amount of success stories in many different fields, and that is due to that the RISC-V is the only uh, industry-proven ISA that allows users to customize, fully customize it based on their requirements. And System LSI has also uh, announced uh, several times that we adopted RISC-V in a lot of embedded cores in our product. And today, I'm going to share one of the successful uh, adapt adaptation of the RISC-V in RF uh, based on the customization capability. So in many of the embedded systems, uh, we have a very strict timing requirement, so-called the real-time applications. And I'm not sure how many of you are very familiar with the picture shown on the left side. It's a capture of a rhythm game where very, uh, numerous bars are coming down from the top to the bottom. And you have to make an input command per each of the bar at the exact right timing. If you press the button too late, you miss. If you, even if you make the input too early, you also miss. 
And this is actually what comes to me as the best example of a real-time application. And just by hearing it or playing it, you can know that it's very difficult to meet. But when, you, when it comes to development of hardware systems, you have to face much more strict and difficult timing requirements. The right side table shows the 3GPP specifications for 5G communication. And it shows that the, the duration of symbol time is narrowing down to as short as four microseconds. And it specifies that you should be able to configure the ICs differently at each of the symbol, meaning that a lot of um, constraints on the timing. And to deal with this kind of very strict timing requirements, it is much easier to go in a hardware solution. But due to the contradictory requirements, we, uh, software-based solution is becoming much more popular and even essential in these domains. The specification are being, the development process of the specification takes a long time, and it tends to change from day to day, uh, while the IC development cost and time also takes a lot, and when you have to do a hardware revision, it's going to cost you a fortune. At such a given circumstances, hardware development should run and begin before the specification is ratified or frozen, meaning that you have to have the programmability at the back based on the software to meet the changing specifications. So how do you deal with the real-time uh, problems in the software. I believe the most general solution is interrupt-based control, if not the only solution. Uh, you still have the fine-grained hardware timers or tick generators that uh, generate interrupts for the core at the exact right timing. And when the core on receiving the interrupt, it can directly begin configuring the chip as intended. Unfortunately, <laughs> Even the interrupt-based system that cannot always guarantee the exact timing due to some reason, multiple reasons. In a complex system, there are a lot of multiple interrupts coming in simultaneously. And you, in many cases, you have to prioritize them so that the higher level interrupts should preempt the previous interrupt. And this, yeah. Uh, introduction of the preemption causes uh, unwanted software overheads due to the uh, switching, context switching overhead and critical sections. So when the higher level interrupt comes in, during, while the previous interrupt is running at the critical section, you, st you have to wait until the critical section ends before you can actually enter the next interrupt, upcoming interrupt. And even after start beginning the servicing the next interrupt, you have to spend a uh, much uh, large amount of time saving the previous context. Uh, with a very critical timing requirement, we didn't want this to happen, so we wanted to customize our cores by using additional hardware. We wanted the higher level interrupts to be able to immediately begin its actual control tasks when the interrupts comes in, which we call the immediate interrupt service routine. It, this was also presented earlier this year at the IEEE Design Automation Conference. And we do this by, oh, sorry, yeah. we do this by making two major changes. First of all, we duplicated most of the registers, including the general purpose registers, as well as the you know, control status registers, which eliminates the need to save and restore the previous context. And we modified the interrupt control mechanism so that it natively supports hardware preemption without having to additionally uh, configure any registers by the software. And this approach was turned out to be pretty successful in our silicon. We actually saw about like 30% of reduction in the total control time in our, uh, in our devices. It was measured in the silicon. But it follows up with some, uh, some questions. Is this going to be a scalable solution that can actually you know, be apl applicable to multiple different domains with different requirements and complexity or size, et cetera? Or is it just good to be a very localized solution that only works for our application? 
Well, the, this next slide, this was uh, something that was presented by Dr. Yeonsom Lee many years ago. I was very much inspired with this picture. Uh, this was the answer to the question how the risk vibe as an open source ISA is going to deal with fragmentation issues. And it denotes that we call it fragmentation when we are solving the same problem in different ways, and, but which risk vibe want to avoid. And risk vibe is tending to go in the diversity where it tries to solve the new hard problems in an effective way. So having this in mind, going back to the question, uh, optimizing the interrupt services are a very common problem that has been dealt throughout multiple different architectures and a lot of hardware optimization techniques. So if we just go with a very localized solution for our application, this is, we believe this is a fragmentation which we have to avoid. So we decided to extend our works with the three key objectives. We wanted our architecture to be more scalable, so it's applicable across multiple different domains with different complexity, size, or performance of requirements. And we wanted it also, we also wanted it to be orthogonal so it can work on top of the existing architecture or exist, existing optimization techniques without hurting the original purpose of optimization and still gaining additional performance. And finally, we wanted to be transparent at the top level software. We wanted user software to be able to run with our benefit from our architecture without having to know it or modifying the code. So starting from the previous work, we added the flexibility for, into the architecture where it allows uh, selecting, uh, adaptively using the iSQL SR feature for selected level of interrupts only, while the other levels still use the conventional ways. We do this by adding a lookup table that maps the, each interrupt in the ways. And this includes the configurability in the very extreme, extreme cases where we define none of the interrupts to use the iSQL SR, which will just be explanation of the conventional interrupt architecture. And it also includes having all the interrupt levels being using the iSQL SR, which is just a, uh, our previous work itself. And on, on top of this hardware uh, implementation, we also want to provide the encapsulation ways to you know, provide the transparency at the top level softwares. So if we have the hardware implementation on the bottom, we probably, this is just an example because all different types of system can have different types of frameworks, but on top of it, we can have some hardware abstraction layer that provides the device drivers that uh, exploits the, our architecture to you know, provide more performance. And on top of that, again, we, can, we have some modified APIs for interrupts that maps the interrupts differently, either to the iSQL SR method or the original method. And the application running on top, they do not have to be modified at all, and they can just uh, enjoy the fruit without no, even knowing that uh, what's going below this. And, <clears throat> I do have some time, but uh, there are a lot of more uh, details and experiments result with this adaptive interrupt architecture we are developing, but uh, having the limited time of presentation here, I don't want to share every bit of details here, but instead I want to uh, just conclude this uh, presentation by sharing that we propose the scalable interrupt architecture that is supposed to be scalable across multiple domains of different size, different complexity, different interrupt architecture. Our goal is that what we think is it's really beneficial to have one unified architecture when we are solving the same problem because it really helps preventing the you know, fragmentation. And in addition to this, while I only talked about the you know, interrupt control methods in my, this talk, I think the same principle to avoid the fragmentation, this holds to all different types of applications as well, such as the, like machine learning or other fields. Uh, and in the beginning, because nobody actually, in the beginning of the competition, nobody really knows the exact right way to solve the problem. So there 
should be some inevitable discrepancies between each of the implementation. But at the end, I believe the other architecture should be unified to have a one single solution while the competition can still continue on in the implementation details and architecture configuration. With having this, I believe the risk 5 can continue to grow to be the one unified and standardized instruction set that can be used to solve the upcoming future problems. Yeah, that's all for my presentation. Thank you very much for listening. So, yeah, I finished the presentation pretty early, so we have some time for questions, I think. Uh, it looks like uh, NMI may have served your mm -hmm. uh, goal in this. Uh, did you try it NMI? I, I didn't hear you. Uh, NMI, non-maskable interrupt. Ah, NMI. Uh, NMI, uh, in my point of view, is just a uh, single source of interrupt at the highest level that can uh, be ex executed at any time. But we wanted the flexibility with different levels of interrupts that has more, I mean, uh, not in the other times, the highest priority interrupt has to be, uh, has the most impact on the performance. Sometimes the highest level interrupt is just something that uh, notifies you of some hardware error or something like that. That, that, is, that needs to be executed before other interrupts, but that doesn't really need a lot of performance in servicing it. So I, I wanted to have more flexibility, but like even the lower level interrupts that may have much more performance impact in the system, they can be selected to be uh, executed much faster. I wanted those kind of flexibility. Yeah. So have you looked at the, the fast interrupt um, extension that's, that's undergoing finishing up yes. right now. Uh, yeah, I, while, while I was working on this, I was also knowing, I also noticed that fast interrupts and other uh, specifications are going on. But uh, I was, I, I didn't, I'm, I don't have the full understandings on the specification. I didn't have the time to fully cover that. But I believe that uh, it doesn't really cover the methods of duplicating the registers for selected levels of interrupts. And I, my goal is that this architecture can be orthogonal to those types of architectures. It can add some additional performance benefit without like, hurting the, how this control is going on. That. A question about debug. How you want to debug such a system? Uh, Ah. Yeah. Oh, yeah, <laughs> you mean because of the duplication, how are we going to know the previous context register value or right, something like that? Right, right. Yeah. There should be some memory map ways or other uh, additional instructions added to be able to you know, access the registers from the previous context. But most, in most cases, this will only be probably only be allowed in like, uh, the context when you are actually on the highest privilege or some kind of debugging privilege. In general application, I think it's even better to hide the values from the previous context. Not knowing it is even much better. So for the, for the debug purpose, there should be some additional instruction that can actually access the previous values or memory map accesses. Yes. Yeah. I think we are time of, out of time. Thank you very much for listening. You can come up to me and yeah, for any further discussions.